Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar with Paul, um, who is the founder at Perfect Balance Consulting. And uh, he's got a very interesting webinar today um, talking about emotional intelligence for success. I don't know if anyone's uh, been reading up on it, but it is very interesting. And um, so before I hand it over to him, I just want to make sure that everyone is properly connected. So please note that you are all on listen only mode, so we will not be able to hear you. But Paul will be taking your questions after his presentation. So for that, you will be using the Q&A tab found at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions. For best results, please use a laptop or a desktop computer. If you are using mobile devices such as um, your cell phone or tablets, I recommend downloading the Zoom app. It's very easy. You can just type in the meeting ID and log in. And your feedback is always important to us, so please do fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. Um, oh yes, and just to let everyone know, um, our webinars are always recorded. And if you'd like to watch this webinar again, you can use the same Zoom registration link. It turns into a recording later. And if anything, you will get um, a recording link and some other resources tomorrow sometime. Um, and just to let you know a little bit about Access, we've been around for over 30 years helping job seekers such as yourselves. We work with over 2,200 employer connections such as um, employers that hire from uh, hire employees um, from us. And we've got community partners several sponsors, um, and we've got over 30 tailored programs, which include our bridging program and a pre-arrival program, programs for women, programs for youth. So check out our website to see you what you'd be legible for. And we've got seven locations in the GTA, currently serving everyone from our online location. So if you are interested in any of our programs, um, this is the best time to actually do them because you can do it from the comfort of your own home and you don't have to worry about commuting to any of our locations. So take advantage of that. And I'll tell you more about it after the presentation as well. So Paul, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Thank you very much, Sonia. So let me just um, share my screen with uh, everyone. Great, I hope um, that everyone can see, see my screen. So. Welcome everyone, and thanks for attending the, uh, sem the seminar, the webinar on uh, leveraging emotional intelligence for success. So let me tell you a little bit about myself and my passion for emotional intelligence. I spent 35 years navigating the corporate world or the hostile jungles, I sometimes fondly think of it. I've worked in four different countries. I've visited around 75 countries, either for pleasure or for business. And I guess I've dealt with a lot of senior people in my career, servicing boards of directors for the last 20 odd years or so. And I've come across a number of sort of A-type people, you know, very direct and task oriented with very little appreciation, I guess, for the impact of their communication. And so my most recent role was a wonderful position in the Middle East where um, I was head of corporate governance and I particularly needed in that role to have a high degree of emotional intelligence or from what I'm going to call it from now on EQ or emotional quotient. So I had to build relationships, I had to develop my role and as an influencer because despite you know a relatively senior position I had no line authority. So in other words I had to really influence people to uh, get them to, to do what you know accept my advice essentially and I needed to build that trust and credibility so out of necessity I needed to develop my EQ to sort of levels where I could uh, function effectively in my role and one thing I did find was that that wasn't always reciprocated particularly as the bank was a fairly political organization so as a result I became really interested in the whole concept of EQ I'd studied it in in uh, previous years as well um, but just really how it can be used to improve the culture of a workplace and also how it can be used on an individual level as well to to improve people's you know lives and, and how you how you feel about things on a daily basis 
And so I qualified as an EQ practitioner and I'm also a certified uh, group and life coach. So what we'll be discussing today is not just around how you can use EQ to progress in the job search or indeed when you're working here in Canada, uh, but also these are strategies that you can use wherever you are um, in and out of work. So if you adopt and embrace some of these strategies that we're going to talk about today over a sustained period of time, I truly believe that you'll be healthier, happier and definitely better positioned to navigate the inevitable challenges that you'll face as a, a new entrant into Canada. So what are we going to talk about today? So the, here's today's agenda. We're going to start off with uh, what uh, is EQ. Now, I, I deliver this webinar with a heavy caveat because the topic of EQ really encompasses a whole industry and has spawned countless books, some more than others. So I'm not going to guarantee that you'll be experts in EQ but within the next hour because I can really only scratch the surface. However, I do hope that I will have piqued your interest enough so that it's something you'd like to look into further. And I will be um, offering some free tools and resources for some of you that make it to the end of the webinar. So we'll take a brief look at EQ and how it evolved. And we'll also be looking at the benefits of developing EQ as well, which again are so significant, we can only really touch on some of those main benefits. But we'll be looking at some of the various elements of EQ and how these sort of break down into various other skills. And one thing I would say from my experience is that all of the EQ skills are interrelated. For example, you're not going to be good at stress management if you get angry at the slightest provocation. You're not going to be empathetic if you're a poor listener. And so we'll be doing some exercises as well as so how to develop your EQ, because the good news is that Despite what some people would say, it's not a case of being born with it or not. I think all of the skills and strategies to develop EQ can be learned, although they do take time, effort and patience and often professional guidance as well. But I can assure you that the investment is worth it. Um, therefore, in any schoolroom style, I'm not going to let you get away with doing nothing in this webinar because anything worth having takes time and effort. And so I'll be asking for your contribution around uh, some of the exercise that we'll be doing. It's a little bit of homework. So stay with me and I promise that it will all be worth it. So defining EQ, what is EQ? The ability to understand, express and manage your own emotions, to develop and maintain good social relationships and to think clearly and to solve problems under pressure. Now, there's a million definitions of EQ out there, depending on which books you read. I like this definition because it speaks to the internal and external aspects of EQ. Now we use information provided by our emotions to build a productive response to act appropriately in the face of daily challenges. So someone with high EQ is able to understand their limitations and strengths, are able to work in diverse teams and show empathy. And it's about knowing your emotions and understanding where your emotions are coming from and how to control them. But it's also so much more than that because it's also about the uh, EQ of others as well. It's about you having the sensitivity and the awareness of how others may be feeling, which in turn gives you information about how you then are going to react. And having empathy for them so that you know how to work with people, how to live with people, and how to just generally be around with people so that you can control your emotions in any uh, situation. Now, understanding these behaviours, I think, will give you a competitive advantage in the Canadian workplace because, as I mentioned before, even when I was in the Middle East, um, those EQ skills in the workplace are not always present there. And so... In the Canadian workplace, there's definitely a greater emphasis on uh, than ever on the way people conduct themselves. And Canadians, by nature, are relatively conservative and polite, and they won't always tell you what they're thinking. And so some of these protocols will help you enormously in navigating that, that Canadian work, workplace, the landscape, as well as equip you with the confidence to go out and network, and build relationships, something which really is a cornerstone of the Canadian employment landscape. So much emphasis on networking. 
And so there's less emphasis, I think, on formal qualifications and more emphasis on the sort of personality and the ability to build relationships than they used to be. So in other words, people want to hire other people that they feel they can work with, that they feel will fit into the organization. And so the beauty with someone with high EQ is that they're flexible, they're adaptable, and this makes them better suited to uh, most organizations. So let's look at the origins of uh, EQ. Just where, where did emotional intelligence all start? Um, so there's been various references to, uh, to the term since the late 1950s and 60s, but I guess as a discipline, it didn't really start to develop until 1990 when two Yale psychologists called Peter Salovey and John Meyer carried out extensive research and actually coined the term emotional intelligence. They wrote a paper on EQ and it was picked up by uh, Daniel Goleman, who at the time was working for the New York Times. And he was a Harvard trained psychologist and he was interested in its application uh, in business to start with. And he came up with the idea that people that are truly successful in business don't just need the intellectual side, um, they also need the emotional side of intelligence. They, they need to know when the use of emotions are appropriate. So he then wrote a book simply entitled Emotional Intelligence, uh, which became a New York Times bestseller and the seminal work on EQ. Now, the fact is that EQ is a, can be applied to any part of your life, not just business. And in my view, as, as parents, you can work with your children to develop uh, their EQ. And that would be fantastic because, you know, for those of you that are parents and have, like me, teenagers, the challenges that your children face at that age are considerable. And the benefit of having EQ and being able to sort of deal with those teenage issues is immeasurable. And I truly believe that it would vastly improve the relationship with your child. So since Goldman's work, there has been considerable evolution in the concept of EQ. Yet I have to say that we're still learning about that part of the brain. And Goldman's book has a significant commentary around the workings of the brain and how it can control our emotional responses. Well, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a scientist, so I'll leave that analysis for another day. But what are the benefits of uh, EQ, um, good, strong emotional intelligence? Well, again, as I mentioned before, they're too numerous to mention, so I've really focused on some of the key benefits that I've personally experienced in studying EQ. Suffice to say that I wish I'd studied the discipline of EQ earlier in my life because it would have saved me a lot of pain and frustration. You know, particularly when things weren't going well, I tended to get angry as if, you know, the whole world was against me. I would have been better at my relationships and better at handling conflict of, at work if I'd had some of these strategies. And I think it would have made me a better parent as well. Although I have to say that, you know, my children are remarkably well adjusted considering they have me as a father. So if I could reach back uh, to my quarter of a century younger self, uh, my advice would be to study EQ and master it to live a happier and healthier life. Oh, and I would also tell myself to buy some shares in Apple too. So, but there, there's some, some of my five benefits, top benefits in having a strong EQ, a huge increase in mental health. It redefines the way that you think about things it equips you with the tools to decide how you want to feel instead of being a slave to emotion i think it also enables you to handle stress much better because it connects really to the first point around mental health because a person with high eq is better equipped to deal with stressful events because you know you don't freeze and stress in itself is an, an emotion which really can get the better of you it also develops your communication and interpersonal skills. Now by exhibiting EQ, you become a better communicator and a better speaker. And also more importantly, I think an active listener as well in order to display the skill of empathy. Uh, you become much more acute to non-verbal signs such as body language and facial expressions. You're much better able to 
read the room. I have to say that would have been fantastic skill when I was in my late teens and seemingly getting rejected by every girl in town. Been so useful. I think it can help you to create more productive relationships as well, which means that particularly in the work context, you're much more likely to become an influencer, which will make you happier and more satisfied in your job. Of course, the relationship benefits go to every part of your life because as social beings, you know, we, everything we do is about relationships and good relationships at home and work will just generally make you feel happier. It can also connect you, I think, with the purpose and the things that you're passionate about. And so much of EQ is about self-awareness and connecting with the things that you truly care about and that can help you to define um, you know, your passion and identify things that you really, really feel you care about and you're passionate about. I mean, my passion is to help people to live better, more productive lives. Um, how do I do that? I changed di direction, you know, moved away from the corporate side to become a coach and mentor. And I truly love doing this because I feel that it just makes a difference. And even if I can make even a small difference to just one of your lives, then, you know, this webinar is worth it as far as I'm concerned. So those are my top benefits. Uh, we're going to be delving deeper into some of the attributes of EQ, but based on what you've heard so far, uh, I'd like you to think about um, some of the benefits that you think would resonate with you. And perhaps you can uh, use the chat function. And uh, I'll just set the timer here. So I'll give you a minute uh, to upload some of those answers in the chat function. I'll be very, very interested in your responses. So I'll start the timer now. All right, we are out of time. Uh, so, whoops, move that along. Okay, so let's look, have a look at some of the answers here. EQ makes it easy to build networks, helps to develop relationships, develops trust, understanding, communication, uh, helps stop unnecessary worry and wasted time. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, we, we spend so much time, don't we, worrying about things that often we have no control over. Healthy life, reduce conflict, uh, peace, conflict resolution, better communication, being mindful of how others can interp uh, interpret our message. Absolutely, some great answers there. Yeah, yeah. So, so whole range of benefits that can really, really be uh, important to you. So let's look at some of those attributes. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for uh, your contribution on the uh, chat function there. We'll have some other questions that we'll be raising uh, soon as well. So let's look at those elements of EQ. Well, the first one is self-perception. And so this is really how we see our inner self, how we perceive ourselves as individuals and in relation to, uh, to others. Um, and it defines how I think confident and independent we are, which in turn defines how we set and achieve goals in life. And so before I talk about self-regard, I want to raise another question um, using the chat function. When something goes wrong, how do you generally feel about the way that you've handled it? How self-critical are you? Do you beat yourself up about it? Or um, are, you, are you fairly kind with yourself? Again, just a minute for you to uh, think about how you respond to those situations. When, when something goes wrong in your life, how do you react? Give you another minute or so just to 
put a few answers there in the chat function. I said I'd work you hard today. All right, fabulous, we're out of time. So let's have a look at some of the answers here. Yeah, um, go to bed, next day should be brighter. Good, positive. I'm aggressively stressed out. I critique myself most of the time, fight or flight. Uh, try and think positively, excellent. Critical, uh, most times I beat myself up um, and look inward for solutions. Frustrated, sad, angry, uh, sometimes calm, uh, freeze, fearful. Um, can't think, hopelessness, uh, what could I have done better, react poorly. Yeah, blaming myself. I, I think there's a recurring theme here, and, and you're not alone. I think that most of you are saying generally that you're fairly critical. And I think this negative self-talk is fairly common, but it really does you no good. And I think you know that as well. The irony, I think, is that most people are less hard on other people than they are on themselves. I mean, they can really talk themselves down and not make allowances for themselves that they would for others. And this can chip away at your self-esteem and self-confidence. So I, I would say to you, respect yourself and it becomes easier to respect others. And so what I wanted to do, a bit of homework for you is, um, I want you to go away from this webinar to write up a list of all the things that you really like about yourself and the qualities that you have. Maybe have your friends and family help as well. And put that list close to you to see every morning when you wake up and you can realize what a, an amazing, unique person you are. But then when we look at, uh, so self-regard is always an issue. Um, for, for many people. Let's look at emotional self-awareness. Well, this gives us the power to recognize our emotions and how it can impact our behavior so that we're in touch with our feelings and that we can read the feelings of other people. And I think by consciously connecting your emotions to your behavior, you can interpret your emotional response to events or triggers in a more conscious fashion so that you act more responsibly. There's an expression called passions slaves which Goldman devotes a whole chapter to and it's our propensity to for anger now if you remember that emotions serve a purpose they're telling us something uh, and are evolutionary in nature for example the rush of adrenaline is fight or flight that some mentioned in the chat function it's a primeval response needed when our ancestors were being chased by saber-toothed tigers or in Canada when people are selling you air duct cleaning same thing, fight or flight. The principle remains the same. If you're able to recognize this emotion and, and step back from it, uh, when you start to get angry and you use physical strategies, such as taking a deep breath, remove yourself from the situation, such as uh, a situation like an inflamed argument, well, you can ensure that you'll, you'll not do something that you might later regret because there's far too many catastrophic incidents where people have acted irrationally because rage essentially has kidnapped their ability to think logically. Self-actualization, um, this is really an honest appraisal of your strengths and weaknesses so that you know yourself um, better and in doing so you can identify the things that give your life meaning and purpose. So in other words, doing what you were meant to do. I think the concept of self-actualization is something that few people really reach because it's about achieving your potential. And um, so really thinking about what really matters to you. What are your values? How can you live a life with purpose? If you could do anything, what is it that you would love to do? And like I say, my passion is working with individuals and organizations around uh, EQ strategies. 
and helping them to become better colleagues, team players and leaders and increase their job satisfaction. So it's something I'd like you to, um, to also take away and, and think about um, as well, about living a balanced life um, that really is doing things that you're uh, passionate about. So I'll, I'll leave that for you to, um, to, to think about uh, as well after the seminar. What is it that you really love to do? And the thing also, I, I think, in terms of um, living a balanced life that I've mentioned, in my own uh, life, as it were, I incorporate physical activity in my daily routine because exercise, as you know, has a huge number of health benefits, including better sleep, and also take time to recharge as well, to relax and engage in activities that will bring me pleasure, um, you know, family time and playing my guitar, however badly, uh, something that I'm grateful for the opportunity to, um, you know, be able to do those things that I really enjoy. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to turn my passion into a habit and developing uh, courses, public speaking, doing things like this. It really just, for me, is, is very important. So then we look at uh, emotional self-expression. And what do we mean by that? Well, essentially, it's the ability to express our feelings in a appropriate and constructive way rather than letting our emotions dictate our behavior so it really follows on closely from emotional self-awareness because we are assessing our emotions almost as if we could step outside our body and dispassionately observe ourselves so some of the key aspects of um, attributes of self-expression is first of all your ability to constructively express your emotions and what comes first, thoughts or feelings? Well, we don't always know, but our reactions are um, uh, certainly in the form of thoughts and feelings. And so being skilled in this area enables you to regulate those reactions. And it takes practice. For example, if you're in a conflict situation with your spouse or partner, have you ever said to your partner, you always do that? I know I have. And you might think, well, Oh, they're a bad person because they did something that you perceive to be bad. But really, when you express your emotions appropriately, you should be specific and specify how your feelings have been hurt. Describe the behavior first and how it made you feel rather than making it personal. In other words, you could use a questioning approach. For example, say, well, what were you thinking when you did that? Remember that communication is 55%. You may not know this, but communication is 55% body language, 38% tone, and just 7% are the words. So really, it's important when you consider that to think about how you say things and not just um, what you say. Assertiveness as well. In my experience, this is something where people are not so great at this particular skill. It's not being pushy or arrogant, um, and it's certainly not being aggressive but it does enable you to stand your ground and say no, and to convey your opinions in, in a non-offensive way. And so that's something that I'm sure many of you may have had some challenges in. I know for me, it was definitely a problem in the past. And I got walked all over because I failed to stick up for myself in an appropriate way. And so this skill, I think is again, very important for your mental health because if you do get treated badly and you put up with it, the resentment eventually will cause you physical and mental health problems later down the line. So definitely practice being assertive, even if it doesn't come naturally. And, and certainly that there's you know, some strategies I can help you with in regard to that. Independence. Now this is about being self-reliant, uh, free of the emotional dependence on others. In other words, you're able to function autonomously. You're not afraid to seek counsel or feedback from others. And you're confident and empowered enough to receive criticism as an opportunity for learning and growth. Uh, because it's really um, a belief, independence is a belief in our ability to be able to deal with life and not be reliant on others for our physical and emotional well being. And I equate this particular skill with authenticity and having a strong set of values and moral compass, if you like. In other words, uh, living the life according to the principles that you set for your, uh, yourself and not being swayed by other sort of negative uh, influences. 
So living your life on your terms, I mean, who, who really doesn't want that? Interpersonal, let's look now outward. We talked about inwards uh, facing. Let's look outward now, outward aspects of um, EQ, those sort of interpersonal uh, skills. Um, this is one, to me, one of the most satisfying and important aspects of the EQ journey, because as we said, we interact with people throughout the day, every day, yet we rarely sort of analyze how those interactions have gone and how we could have made them better, not just for ourselves, but also for the person that we're uh, interacting with. And so people with strong EQ are highly sort of conscious of their relationships and how they communicate with others. And it's really about developing a sensitivity to others and how they uh, perceive you. So if we look at some of these areas here, the interpersonal relationships, and I, I don't need to tell you how mutually satisfying relationships and connections uh, are, how they can enhance your life. And the more we contribute, um, the more secure our relationships are, the quality of life. But of course, it does take effort and to build those sort of long lasting relationships. And um, really being able to, to connect, say dealing with your spouse or your partner, will be very different to how you deal with your boss, but you can still use some of the same sort of strategies. One of the key things, of course, is, is being able to work through any conflicts in a respectful manner, whilst being assertive, uh, which we talked about earlier. So one way is to develop empathy, and we'll, we'll look at that shortly. The, the point is, of course, is making issues um, you know, conflict issues based and not personal. And that applies equally in business as it does in your, um, you know, outside of work, private life. Communicate in an honest way, uh, direct, but in an authentic way, which means being direct doesn't mean bluntness. It just means that you're clear about what it is that you want from the conversation or the negotiation so that people can understand you. As uh, Stephen Covey said in his amazing book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, which um, I definitely recommend you read, um, seek first to understand and be understood. So from your perspective, as a new entrant into Canada, I think it's important that you nurture relationships that will help you ultimately to you know, really get settled in the country and hopefully expand your business and social network work which of course can lead to job opportunities but also the opportunity maybe to do a new hobby something that you hadn't really thought about before and in doing so building lasting friendships I mean one of my most enduring friendships in Canada is just being my hiking buddy because we don't do much else together but our hike gives us the opportunity to really catch up and put the walls uh, to rights so let's look at empathy now I think one of the things here is that um, it, it's a skill that we probably have heard of, but how many of us really can say that we are truly empathetic? I, I know for myself, it's a work in progress. How many times have we been involved with someone and pointedly refused to accept their point of view? I think we're all guilty of it. And having the skill of empathy is understanding the sensitivity of others. And if you like walking a mile in that person's shoes, it's a really good skill to have, but it takes the time to develop. And you need to be an active listener as well, which means that um, you are able to give them your full attention, which means not just hearing them, but also listening to what they have said and really seeking to understand their viewpoint. And I think that um, that doesn't mean that you necessarily agree with it, but the mere fact of acknowledging the viewpoints gives validity when people want to be heard. And so I recently wrote an article on LinkedIn about how to deal with difficult people at work because we all have them. And one of the strategies that I suggested was to try and change your mindset, not think of that person as an enemy, try and understand their thought process and be curious about them and get a better understanding of why they behave what they do with a view to sort of building bridges and connecting. And, you know, in the workplace, it can be as simple as a smile in the morning or generally just being more friendly. So I think that's, uh, it's important to take an interest in people and really get to know them. So I'd just like to, uh, with that in mind, I'd just like to, again, uh, ask you to uh, put in the chat function, again, 60 seconds, just to think about how you can build 
more productive relationships? What strategies can you use to build productive relationships? I'll set the timer going. We've got the 60 second countdown left. <clears throat> All right, time's up everyone. So let's just have a look at some of those uh, answers here. So um, non-work conversations, uh, learn to listen more, establishing trust, being unassuming and showing a positive attitude towards people around you. Absolutely. Showing empathy, being selfless and yeah, tell people the positive points of their view, having frequent discussions with colleagues um, and active listening, absolutely. Um, making sure everyone's needs are met. Yeah, sometimes it can be a process of negotiation um, as well and being open to, to them rather than transparent. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Some great, great answers here. Addressing issues directly as well. Being assertive, I think is very important. Uh, being a good listener. Yeah, some great answers, everyone. Thank you so much. I haven't got time to go through all of those answers but super answers i can see that you've all really thinking about how important empathy actually is and then we look at social responsibility well that's really sort of draws on from empathy and it's really about building relationships generally and changing your mindset um, for any new person that you meet instead of thinking what can they do for me change it up and ask yourself what can i do for them you know i, I think it will reap rewards in the long run and I'm a great believer in karma. So just doing things where, um, you know, you can give back and help other people. And even really just small acts of kindness that can sometimes take very little effort. In fact, the late, great Winston Churchill said that we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. I think that's a great, uh, great um, point to make about, you know, how we develop our sense of personal responsibility and it's not just about giving charitable donations it's actually really providing tangible support in your community and for example you know a situation may be at the moment that you know you're looking for work in Canada why not perhaps uh, think about volunteering opportunities because that can be a great opportunity to get some Canadian work experience and to build networks that may hopefully take you to the next um your your next role you know in, in canada you never know what doors it can open so i think that's that's the important thing so let's look at the decision making skills this is another key attribute uh, eq attribute and you're probably all good decision makers because you've already made the decision to come to canada you probably consider the benefits and the downsides of uh, emigrating to, to canada and i'm sure that you've probably made decisions um in life that you've regretted, later regretted. I know I've made more than I can possibly count. And I would say continue to do so on a daily basis, uh, some with more severe consequences than others. But I think being able to develop strategies that support your decision-making is a key part of EQ. So problem solving, of course, having the ability to identify um, and define the problems and think of solutions is really an essential skill particularly where emotions are involved because as you know emotions can cloud our judgment and so a truly good decision maker will be able to analyze the problem without emotion describe the problem and the root cause and then brainstorm alternative solutions and in doing so then arrive at um, the best solution and then also of course making sure that when you implement the solution you follow up and you evaluate the solution and monitor the progress. Now, it sounds easy in principle, but it, it really isn't. And the main skill, I think, is 
being able to detach your emotions from the problem and so that you can really think clearly. And in some ways, uh, a good way of trying to do this is to almost like visualize yourself outside of your body and be a detached observer. And by removing yourself from the situation, the issue, your emotional intensity actually reduces and you can think more rationally and uh, calmly as well. And so it will help you just to be able to remove yourself from some of those intense emotional triggers that may be part of that whole decision making pro process. It's not easy. Like I said, um, I'm still learning it myself and sometimes I slip up, but you know, sometimes we make mistakes. Let's be kind to ourselves. Let's, let's not beat ourselves up. Then of course, reality testing. Well, this is about an ability to see things as they really are based on objective evidence. It takes courage to question our own opinions on a certain matter because our assumptions may not necessarily be shared by others. We talked about empathy and really just being able to see other viewpoints. And this is really about reality testing, really considering other viewpoints that may not necessarily uh, be ourselves. And I think that if you have that reality testing mindset, you're more able to uh, you know, take criticism and, and feedback uh, without being defensive and use it as an opportunity for learning. And it'll give you the bravery, I think, to confront the truth. And um, I would suggest that you find some honest friends, not the ones that always tell you everything is fine, you're a wonderful person, but those that will tell you the truth, even when it may be uncomfortable for you. Now, these types of friends are extremely valuable and you should pay close attention to them because they'll help you to challenge your, your own beliefs. Uh, you've got to be good friends to, to do that. Impulse control. Now, I talked about the strategy of removing yourself from an intense emotional situation in order to make a better decision. And that's often a matter of impulse control, resisting the impulse to, uh, to act. And an ancient Chinese proverb says that if you're patient in one moment of anger, you will avoid a hundred days of sorrow. I think that's an important lesson that we mustn't react. And as Goldman described in his book, uh, become passion slaves. Um, you know, con controlling our emotions is very important. But how can we do this? Well, some of the strategies to help control your impulses is to really think about your body, your physical and mental well-being, which are uh, intimately attached. And so things such as controlling your breathing and calming your mind, even during a flash of anger. And there's a lot of resources around sort of med the benefits of meditation or even just going for a walk to have a think about things and, and to give a different perspective and remove yourself from the situation as well, um, or where, where you could be angry as well. And so um, it's not just about the impulse to be emotional, of course, it's also um, impulse control is about having self-control to delay gratification. And there's a lot of studies um, around that show people who are able to delay gratification, are way more disciplined because uh, in the pursuit of their goals, and really because they're, and they're much more likely to be successful because they, you know, put things off and they're very, very disciplined and focused on their goal. And you can employ that in any of your activities, the work you put in as a volunteer, the effort you put in to build your LinkedIn profile and the relationships that you build will all not bring immediate rewards, but I think they will set you up for lasting success. Okay, so um, let's look at uh, the final sort of group of uh, skills, stress management skills. Well, of course, you know, what we've been talking about up to now has helped you to hopefully will give you some strategies to deal with things in a calmer and less emotional fashion. And this ties in with this element, which is your ability to handle stress. Now, um, we've all had it, of course, um, in 2020, it's been a very, very difficult year. And so how can we actually overcome uh, stress and to live a, a longer, healthier life I think there's three elements to stress management. First of all, the flexibility um, side of things. We live in a world of constant change and the ability to be mentally and sort of emotionally flexible means that you're gonna be less judgmental and less uptight. And just think about the last time that you were forced to deal with change. 
uh, which was outside of your control and think about how you handled it. Um, we won't ask for a poll here, but it's something that you can think about later on today as well. The thing with being flexible, the benefit is that it helps you to, again, regulate your emotions depending on the situation, to be more accepting and compassionate with yourself and recognizing that there are some changes that are outside of your control and you can't do much about it. Um, and, and so avoiding being uh, too self-critical, avoiding worrying too much about the, the future, um, because, you know, obviously that can be um, destructive. And I, I've sort of seen that with some of my friends, uh, my, my children's friends as well, where they've uh, really developed uh, self-destructive behaviors, um, you know, uh, because teenagers worry a lot. And so these things, having an agile mind, will, particularly sort of in the context of things around you, even if it means just taking a walk around the block to think about things and being flexible, um, really it's important. Even things such as changing your routine on, uh, that, that you deal with uh, can just give you a different perspective as well. And I think flexibility goes with adaptability as well, which will you'll certainly need to adapt to things in the Canadian workplace. You know, so important to have those skills. And then, of course, being able to tolerate stress without uh, decreasing performance. And um, this really speaks to um, the way that uh, we handle situations. And again, it's inbuilt. Stress is inbuilt from the Neanderthal times. And we can boost our ability to handle uh, stress um, and, and deal with challenges with more confidence in the future. And some of the tips that um, I, I think about here, it really talks about your resilience. And Nelson Mandela once said, do not judge me by my successes, but judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. Now we all have setbacks, uh, but it's how you respond to those setbacks and uh, how you can really, people with high resilience roll with the punches and, and uh, they can really respond in a positive way even when setbacks occur. So how do we do that? Well, it takes a lot of practice. Some of the things, some of the tips I would give to you are, are Firstly, don't worry about things that are outside your control. What's the point? It uses up uh, useless energy. Be kind to others, of course, and be kind to yourself as well. You know, because if you don't love yourself, it's very hard to love others. Solve the little problems as well. Eat well, exercise. Obviously, these, these are very important things. Uh, doing a hobby, as I mentioned before, playing my guitar and annoying all my family is, is something that relaxes me. Um, Think of change as an opportunity, not a threat as well. Changing your mindset, you know, to, to, to think about these, these potential for the future. Setting yourself realistic goals as well. Let's again, otherwise we, we can be too hard on ourselves uh, because we set goals that we can't possibly achieve. Um, and resolving conflicts as well. I think one of the biggest stresses in, in life is, is um, our conflicts with people it can be. And so resolving those conflicts is very, very important. And I think with all of that, it will give you a more sort of optimistic outlook on life. The glass is half full, not half empty. And so that doesn't mean being unrealistic. It just means that, you know, you look at things in a less pessimistic way. You can anticipate the best outcomes and trust that things will turn out well. Of course, you've got to make preparations for if they may not. But at least if you develop an optimistic mindset, then you're less likely to have that fear of failure um, and that paralysis around taking risks as well. So again, you know, think about it from the point of view that um, uh, if you think of things in a more positive way, A, it gives you a psychological benefit. You're more likely to be focused on your goal. You're not going to be afraid of uh, failure. And if it does happen, it's a learning opportunity. So again, you know, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Um, it's good advice. It's good advice, Rid. I, I, I've had that uh, given to me many many times and just having that whole you can choose how you feel in life so when you wake up are you going to feel pessimistic and sad or are you going to feel optimistic and happy and so those are things that really we we need to work on so very briefly then how does that apply to the canadian workplace we've gone through a whole range of skills and attributes and so how would we apply those skills well we need to understand that the canadian working culture may be very different to uh, what you're used to and the reason that i promote 
EQ is not just for its own sake, but also because it's increasingly becoming recognized as a valuable skill in the Canadian workplace. Now we all understand technical expertise, how that gets us in the door, but that in itself isn't enough. And then these soft skills have been around a long time, but as I mentioned before, they've only really been studied as a science quite recently. And in the Canadian workplace, these skills more than ever uh, hold value, particularly in these sort of difficult uh, times. And in fact, um, a leader survey by Google rated technical skills as only eighth in the list of attributes needed by a leader. The other seven were soft skills. So applying EQ in the Canadian workplace is something you should really seek to do because it will get you um, ahead and it will give you that competitive advantage that we talked about. So, you know, let's just summarize some of those things. Build productive relationships because uh, people can be your advocates and building good relationships is integral to uh, success in the Canadian workplace. Uh, get out there and network. Um, communication is a key to building influence in the Canadian workplace and the ability to clearly articulate your ideas and concepts will be well received. And Canadians value assertive people, but they are um, turned off by people that come across as overly aggressive. So work on your body language, work on your spoken language, practice using the right words. Um, you can even try that on your spouse or partner. You can role play. Next time you have an argument, it's a great opportunity to practice your assertiveness um, on, on your, uh, um, by making it about the issue and not the person. Not that I encourage you to start an argument with your partner for that purpose. But Canadians like people that are generally positive in nature and that have that sort of optimism. And also personal brand is important in Canadian culture. How you conduct yourself, how you present your ideas, how you interact with people, um, all speak to your personal brand. And so a strong and positive personal brand will have you people seeking you out for advice. And in doing so, you can build your influence. And of course, working on your listening skills as well. We talked about how important active listening and empathy is because these are highly valued skills in, in the workplace. And so uh, that's just some of a few of those tips. And like I say, we've really only um, skirted the surface here. Um, ultimately, if I were to sum up all of these skills um, in two words, be happy. You're new to Canada, you've made a choice to come here and the uh, prospects and the potential of setting into a new uh, country, a new community. It's a wonderful, exciting opportunity for a future that has yet to be written. And there will be bumps along the way, of course, and things won't always go as planned. But if you employ some of the strategies that we've talked about today and some of the tools and resources that um, uh, will um, I'm going to talk about shortly is for you to have a sort of happy and contented life because none of us can control other people's responses but you can control your own and so just just to finalize I have some uh, tools and resources on my website happy for you to um, uh, I'll put uh, my website in the um, in the chat function as well just for you to um, access some of those free tools and uh, webinars, certainly if you want to take a deeper dive. Um, as Warren Buffett says, uh, you know, the best investment you can make is uh, in yourself. And so always happy to, to assist any of you in your EQ journey. And so happy to, um, Sonia, I'm happy to open it up to any questions that uh, people may have. And uh, thank you everyone uh, for listening and making it to the end of the webinar. Thank you so much, Paul. That was wonderful. Lots and lots of information for sure. Um, so everyone, if you can start typing your questions into the Q&A tab and we can start taking up uh, your questions. So not the chat, but the Q&A tab. If you have any questions. And um, you can see Paul's contact information on the screen. So if you do think of questions later on, you are more than welcome to contact him directly. He'll be happy to answer your questions.
Thank you, Sonia. I did see that there was a couple of questions. I didn't have an opportunity to uh, go through. There was a couple of questions, I think, that was raised in the chat function, but, uh, but absolutely uh, I'm happy for people to connect with me uh, later if they have any further questions arising from. We do have a very those. interesting question here. <laughs> do you have any tips on applying EQ strategy with help kids behave better? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I, I could spend the, how long have you got? <laughs> that's, that's a great, great question. I'm actually doing a talk on parenting uh, for your oh, uh, nice. EQ parenting for your teenager uh, next week at my uh, son's local school. And so how can we, you know, the, the thing is, uh, it depends on the age of your child. But if you think of a teenager, because that's when really their influence really starts to, your influence starts to wane over a, over a teenager and their peers become way more important. I think one of the key things here is, is um, uh, communication, you know, talking to them, getting them to, for you to be that active listener, somebody that can just sit down with them and, and not judge them either. T teenagers, children don't want to be judged. They want to be listened to. They want to have their voice heard and more and more i think it's about equal partnerships i mean in my in my generation growing up you know my my mum and dad were the boss and it was authoritative i think these days you know we need to be more partners as parents with our children and that just means listening to their perspectives and i think that's important because they will confide in you better and you know what then then they're up to and it's easier to um uh, you know, to, to really oversee them. So opening those communication lines, I'd say is absolutely critical um, parenting any age child. Hope that Thank helps. you. Um, yeah, I, I think you helped answer another question here about parenting as well. Um, we'll take up one more question before um, we head out. How do you deal with stress when preparing for an interview? Yeah, that's, that's a very, very good question. I think preparation is key. Uh, and um, I, I actually have on my uh, website a whole suite of, I, I, I do interview coaching as well. And um, I have a whole suite of the 50 most difficult interview questions. And so happy to share those with anyone that's uh, interested. Um, how do you prepare? Well, uh, well how, how do you overcome stress? I mean, absolutely preparation is key to to getting in there and any presentation or any discussion that you're doing you just have to be prepared which means making sure that you um, you've researched the organization you know uh, who it is you're seeing um, you have considered the organization and some of the questions that you want to ask as well and also one thing I did was um, I always listed down um, uh, often in the particularly in the Canadian interviewing uh, landscape now they'll ask you what's called behavioral questions now these are questions that say oh well how did you exhibit such and such a skill in in you know give me an example so if you list down some of those just you know write down some of those key things where for example you exhibited leadership skills uh, where you're able to solve a project and what skills you use there team building skills all of those attributes that are so important in the workplace and demonstrate how you applied it in a um, situation if you have all of that in your armory then you can walk into an interview with way more confidence and the ability to to answer those difficult questions it will just make you feel better and of course making sure as well that you arrive on time as well and that's very very important because the biggest stress is you leave yourself a little too little time to get to the interview location and that can be the biggest stress and it takes away your mind from the focus of being able to answer the questions <laughs>